Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Right Time. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening wherever you get your podcast. Rate us, review us, give us five stars. You only give us four stars. I'm inclined to believe you are a hater. It is Foxworth Friday. Dominique Foxworth, what's going on? Oh, so much, as usual, to get to. I'm still mad about last week, though. They didn't, they didn't drop that Aaron Rodgers right after we finished recording, yes. but whatever. Yes, they did. By the way, did you peep how I adjusted my seat just to make sure everybody saw Emmy? <laughs> like, I, I really like, every, like, when I, like, I oh, dog, whatever I set up, like, I do a camera shot, and whoever's on the other side is like, yo, can you move this way? I'd be so <laughs> mad when they make me move in front of Emmy, you know? And for those of you who don't know, I have an Emmy, but the reason this Emmy is so cool is because I did not deserve it. Like, like that's why, I, like, I got an Emmy. If I had won an Emmy, it would be like, you know, like, I'd be like, man, keeping that, you know, in a special room and everything else. Nah, baby, I got an Emmy because I executive produced a 30 for 30. So the whole series got one. So since I got it, I'm just flexing it on you. Like that Route 100, I earned that. <laughs> Although somehow I have not been worthy of 100 cents. It's so bizarre. Um, but, you know. Emmy, right here. There she go. Looking sexy. There she go. There she go. I just need to let y'all know, man. Your boy Foxworth, I feel like he kind of tried to shade me this morning. I hit him up. I'm like, yo, is there anything you want to talk about? And the thing that's funny is neither of us ever really has an answer. We like, you want to talk about something? All right, cool. We just pick it out. Um, so, you know, we got there and he was like, he wants to talk about how I'm a Braves fan when it's convenient to me. And that felt like shit. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't mean it as shade. So I think what happened was you normally send me that text and I'm like, no, nah, we figured it out. I think you were just shocked that I responded to it. Like <laughs> and you just didn't know how to take it because I believe that people should do things that are convenient to them. You are a Braves fan <laughs> when it's convenient. I'm not judging you for it. I'm a Maryland Terrapins <laughs> fan when it's convenient. If you notice my Twitter history, we get a couple wins early in the season. I'll be <laughs> tweeting out turtles. Then we go on a mid-season slide, and I disappear. That, and I feel like that's my right. And I think most fans should do this. Like, it's a relationship. You're in a relationship yeah. with this team. And if you're in a relationship with somebody, and they treating you bad, your, your mom not going to be like, well, go back okay. and work it out. They going to change. <laughs> I am completely fine. With, it's not like you're their only fan. You are one of millions of fans. <laughs> and so if they start acting up on you, then you leave them, teach them a lesson. And maybe <laughs> they do right, you come back. And that's what you did. I'm not mad at you. Yeah, I, I guess you know, I could I argue, though, that, that the main reason why you stopped rooting for the Braves hasn't really changed. And now you're back. Yeah, now here's the thing I realized about it is that you're right. It is a relationship. And my relationship with the Braves is a bit more complex than it is with honestly most things places and realms in my life and so what i just kind of like realized about it was you know when i had decided to get rid of them it wasn't because they was losers right right like i'm not one of those people that's like the braves just broke my heart so much no the braves brought me primarily joy i never got to the point where i was like yo uh it gets old winning the national league it gets old going to the playoffs every year i ain't never get to that point that's you greedy not you, you, Dominique, but you yeah, know, yeah, the, the, the other ones. Yeah, you know, that's them greedy folk. I was never in that place, but I didn't like what they became. And now they got a bunch of dudes wearing chains. And I'm like, oh, okay. So, like, we have gone away from what this was before. But then they keep making it complex because mm -hmm. the owners have decided that we're going to be the Trumpiest team yeah. in baseball. And that's not what I stand for. That's right. not what I represent. And... I will say the other thing that's gotten awkward for me. Are you up on the Jock Peterson thing with his pearl Pearls? chain? Yeah. 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 And like, so I was in Atlanta last week for an event. And in the lobby of my hotel, it was like a bull or something like that. I don't remember exactly what it was, but he had the pearl chain around his neck. And I get it, right? Jock played it well. The pearls were unique. So he could say that he stands out. But in the end, you know what's going on here. Them chains wasn't nothing that they could wrap their yeah. arms around until the white man did it. Like, there they, they really ain't no way around that. You know, like, that's what that came down to. The white dude came out with a chain, and now everybody want his pearl chain as if he got the coldest chain. I know he don't got the coldest chain because I know he don't care about chains like our brothers from the Dominican do. <laughs> Yeah, like like they, they have brought their influence to baseball, baby, right there. But it's them chains. The, they, they have, although I think you're right, they do have a crack of wiggle room in that every team has Dominicans with chains. Not every yes. team got pearls. So, like, that's what makes them I, unique. I, I, that's see, their I know. crack. They're, 
There's all they always got to crack a wiggle room. That's the game. <laughs> but, saying, hold on, no hold on. I'm not gonna let you get away with this. I started this by uh, legitimately being on your side with your fanhood, but then yeah. I started talking myself through it. And the things that made you leave this relationship have not changed. They doubled down on it. So, like, I know about the Braves' move to Cobb County and how that's problematic because of you. And I also yeah, yeah, yeah. know about. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I also know and about the tomahawk chop and like all that stuff in part because you bring it up so often yes. and i do know about the trumpiness of all of this they are they are leading in and doubling down just because they put some gold chains on the field you like all right fine nah, 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 it was not so much about the chains as much as if, when they was out here trying to be the enforcers and the keepers of the game and everything that was right with baseball, that wasn't cracking. They stopped doing that and they got the dudes that are the opposite of what Brian McCann <laughs> did not like. Like that, like, like that's what I'm saying, right? Like, like as, as an aesthetic. But then they go and do everything else. And then for that parade, they smashed the gas through Atlanta. They got to Cobb County early. They was like, yo, we got to get up out of here. We just, you know, and I knew they had a lot of ground to cover, so I was down to cut them some slack right. for how fast they was they was blowing through the city of Atlanta. But then they got to Cobb County early. They got a police escort. And I was like, see, here they go again. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And then, and then when they finally got out there um, to White Fly Stadium and <laughs> Joe Simpson, who's broadcasted for many years, he talked about the people. And how they uh, wave towels. He's like, we don't have towels because we got this. And then he started doing the tomahawk chop. Mm -hmm. And one thing I had noticed during the games is they wasn't playing the drum track anymore, at least that I could hear. Like, people had to do it on their own. Nope. They played the drum track, and then everybody did that chop. And I just sat there like, <sighs> why y'all keep doing this? Why y'all keep making this so difficult for people? That's you know what I'm saying? Like, they, they have branded themselves as a team full of that guy. Except they don't have a team full of that guy. They got dudes like Eddie, and they got dudes like Ronald. You know what I'm saying? Even the white dudes name are, J are Freddie and Jock. <laughs> they, yeah, they. I think they're trying to play all sides, but publicly do the thing that's going to get what they think the clientele they want. But just as a as a parade slash party planning, I understand there's stadiums out there, but you're going the wrong way. You want to end in Atlanta, didn't? I, no, I know, no, like. No. Antoine no, Patton was performing. Well, if I want to have a good time, I want to end in Atlanta. <laughs> I will start out in Cobb County. We were <laughs> the Falcons training facility was at Flowery Branch. And had the Falcons won a Super Bowl, we can start it out there. But you know where <laughs> we're going to end it? We're going to end it in the heart of the city. And Antoine Patton and whoever else is performing is going to be there. And it's going to transition right on in to the nightcap. Magic <laughs> damn city. Like, you win a Super Bowl in Atlanta or a championship in Atlanta. That's how you plan the parade. You was gonna have a you gonna have a Super Bowl parade that started at two o'clock in the afternoon so that it can end that night. What's wrong with that? What is wrong <laughs> with that? I want a Super Bowl. We can at two o'clock there's sunlight. You can get all the pictures you want. The kids can be out there. School let out at three. The kids can be out there right now. You asking the kids to skip school. So I want a two o'clock parade. The kids can come out four o'clock before they go home, go right on at home. You get off of work. You ain't even got to skip work. We keep this productivity rolling. You can come out after work <laughs> and do it. And we see you at happy hour. We're going to roll this right into 10 o'clock. Magic <laughs> City Mondays. It's, 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 Doc. Let me tell you this about the parade, though, boy. It ties into something else, just generally Atlanta, which is pandemic. Yeah. What? pandemic what pandemic are you talking about i got off the elevator in my hotel it's one of them hotels where you go to the ground floor and then you take the elevator up to the lobby i get off the elevator and it's a pretty cool little lobby bar pretty sizable it is deep apparently somebody was having a mixer and let me tell you who had a mask on me yeah. like I, I atlanta so wild with it and this to me is the test it's partially about the people in there, but the real test about whether y'all got a pandemic going is whether the employees got one off. Yeah. And the employees didn't. And I'm like, yo, don't you care about yourself? Like, you're not terrified right now? The person at the front desk, all that, they were mask-free. That, that part threw me off. So I was looking at that parade, 
Like, I was like, oh, you gonna go to the parade? Nah, I don't think I want to be surrounded uh, by yeah. the people under those circumstances. I ain't been down to Atlanta or anywhere that far south in a while. Like, I'm in New York and D.C. D.C. is as far south as I've been since this all started. So, like, Jeff Saturday and I worked together on Wednesdays, and I know him for a long time. Love him. Great guy. He is from Atlanta. Like, really Atlanta. Yeah. But now... He got money and he no longer lives in Atlanta. But either way, he's from down there and I see him every Wednesday and we always have a good chuckle about the difference and how the pandemic is treated in New York and where he's from. Because he like, oh, the first time he's like, oh, everybody got masks. He's not like, he's fine with it. He put his mask on. Right. He's just like, I ain't used to this. I ain't had a mask in forever. So yeah, it's, it's wild down there. Yo, well, not wearing a mask is kind of a contagious thing because yeah, you walk in, exactly. you know, like I walk in the lobby and I see my man's there. He was there for the same event. And I'm the one person with the mask. And you almost feel like you're being rude, mm -hmm. right? Because our society showing your face is part of interaction. You know what I'm saying? And so then you wind up feeling like you the jerk, right? You Like you need one more person with you that's on board, right? Like while I was there with him, we started talking to some other folks and they had masks on. Cause like one of them worked for the CDC, one of them was a doctor, and like the other one was married to him. You know what I'm yeah. saying? So they were masked up, and I saw them, and I was like, "Cool, <laughs> what? Put this thing on, you know? Exactly. Like, like, cool. I'm not violating or whatever it is. No, Atlanta was Atlanta was different in that regard from this New York thing, cause it's you know it's masks on the street still here. Oh yeah, yeah. Atlanta ain't Atlanta ain't going for that, At, not even a little bit. And you, the employee's point is right. Because even when you go to restaurants in New York, they do the vaccine check. So most people, not most people, everybody who's patronizing a restaurant is has their mask off. They're eating and drinking and you don't see anybody in mask. The servers, the hostess, everybody. You can't see no nothing but eyes in restaurants or in when you go <laughs> shopping everywhere. It's just eyes. And them people are not playing those games. But it, I mean, it ain't like that elsewhere. Nah, man, the clientele won't it. Like, that's the other part. Like, yeah. for me, personally, please put your mask yeah. on, garçon. Right. I, I'm with you. And I put my mask on when I, like, if I go to a restaurant, I walk in, put my mask on. I don't take it off until the food comes. And I need to go to the bathroom. I put it on when I'm going to the bathroom. And, like, it's it's probably just more performative than anything. I'm not sure that I'm at any risk. But it's in my pocket. It ain't hurting nobody. The employees got their mask yep. on. I'm walking past 10 tables. Let's say I get hit with a sneeze or a cough. Like, I don't want to do that. I don't I don't know. Or someone else is sneezing or coughing. Like, honestly, at this point, I feel like I wear my mask and I know it's supposed to protect both sides, but I wear my mask as like a symbol of respect. You know, yes. like, it's like I put it on like, look, I, I, I ain't playing these games. And I feel like it's the opposite down south where it's like you're the one person with the mask on that just flew in from New York. <laughs> you are sending them yeah. a message that says I don't respect you or believe what you believe. And they might take it as offense, but you don't care. <laughs> nah, nah, man. They just never got started down there. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like they shut down for like a couple weeks or something like that. Right. And then after that, they was like, yo, man, we got to get back at it. And and then they go from there. Because look, man, you know, Atlanta, Air City got its thing that it got. And Atlanta got strip clubs. And I am amazed. They still going. I'm like, oh, no, man. This is <sighs> this is a bridge too far, dog. Yeah, yeah I mean, you got to everybody got to make sacrifices. You got to give up some things that are really I, important. I, 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 I do wonder this, though. So if you were an exotic dancer, yeah. would you wear your mask while you did your job? And the answer is, yeah, depends exactly. on who you are. <laughs> exactly. Some, some, some people might get like might, might have a whole new world yeah. here. Right. Because yeah. look, look, what gets what gets you on the floor? Everybody working with something a little bit different. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like it's like football. So you got speed receivers. You got <laughs> possession receivers. You know, some people there because of their hands. Some mm -hmm. people there because they can block whatever it is. There's different ways to do it. And for some of them, this might have unlocked their true potential because oh, yeah. people is no longer going to be focusing on their weaknesses. I don't got to run no slants or hitches no more. We all mm -hmm. goes. Nine routes. Nine yes. routes. Nine yes. routes. Yes. 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 Stick to what. Think about what I can do. <laughs> think about what I am. On that belly Not check. what I'm not. Let me get some fake eyelashes you know? and get caked up. Yeah. Hey, look, man. Some people are here because they hard workers. Like, not everybody's a five star. <laughs> Right? But in the end, you could turn into an all-pro. Nothing wrong with that. Now, Focusing all your strengths. Now you got me thinking, like, how we have built up this whole industry of sports media around athletes. Like, you can have that industry around everything. Like, I just, yes. any any line of work, there could be first take for dancers. Just talking about people's yes. performance. Like, I, there actually might be a market for that in Atlanta. The only city in America where it is truly competitive and these people are actually athletes. Maybe it's not the only city. Houston, maybe, also. 
But like, if you've ever been in those places, them people are real live athletes. Yeah, no, 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 no. Like, not like that was the thing. You saw the story about the pole assassin, oh, right? Yeah. Pole assassin got core struck. Yeah. Like, like that, like, like, no, Atlanta, not everybody is doing it the same way. Yeah. In Atlanta, there's a whole lot of daddies in Atlanta, like, so that's what I got out of these gymnastics lessons, huh? <laughs> yep, this is this is exactly it. This yeah. is what it turned into. But she drive a real nice car. Yeah. Like, like, like what you want, what you wanted, you may like. You know, Chris Rock had that whole thing about being a dad. It's like your job is to get off, keep off the pole. Yeah, but job one is to get her off your couch, right? <laughs> like job one is for you to yeah. be able to pay your old bills and take care of yourselves. And job one accomplished. Yeah, I mean, the world is changing. Our perception of all that stuff is changing. I'm I'm slower to change that, but I think that like sex work in general is like, I mean, it's something that is to be respected. It's a career path. It's something, way to make money. If you feel empowered by doing that, it's no judgment on it. But I do think that people who like the idea of strip clubs is like what you see on TV and TV is primarily like white culture and stuff like that. And the idea of that is like someone slowly slinkily moving around to some uh, guns and roses or something. I don't know, but I think that's somewhat changing, but there are real, like, I mean, the same way that dance is competitive and, and can be considered uh sport like, like it's the same thing like the uh, well the level of athleticism i've seen people do things in there that at the peak of my core strength i could never imagine mm. doing no see atlanta because the thing that people don't realize and part of why i got no problem talking about it so matter of factly is that atlanta used strip clubs to make itself a destination for like conventions, for mm-hmm. business conferences. Like this was part of the plan. That's why the rules and laws are so liberal about that stuff. And why you think that was the ball game was if our strip club game is strong, then these people, when they got their conference, they gonna come down here and rock with us, right. right? Like that's a big part of why they're there. And I will tell you, going to college in Atlanta, it could have got me fired leaving there because I just didn't realize that people weren't so casual about the strip club. Yeah as they were in Atlanta, right? Because it's just okay. So, like, the idea of people having, like, business lunches and stuff like that in strip club, in Atlanta, that's not some far-off crazy thought, yeah. right? Like, yo, we're going to go to the strip club. That's not wild. You be reading these stories, man. That stuff be getting people fired, dog. Yeah. I never um liked strip clubs. Like, I think strip clubs always seem like a good idea to me when you're sitting around with your guys. <laughs> then, eventually, you get there, and, like, the first few minutes, like, cool, that at some point... I just get sad. You don't have mm-hmm. that experience in Atlanta. And when I got traded down to, to the Falcons, it was the first time I went. I didn't become like a regular. I still didn't love going to them because it just wasn't, I didn't grow up on it. Like it wasn't culturally right. a part of my life and it was never something that I particularly enjoyed. But the sadness, frankly, that I felt going to other strip clubs where it just felt like, oh man, you don't want to be here. You don't, you don't really like me. You just pretending like it just make you feel uncomfortable. You go to Atlanta. <laughs> It's different. It's a lot more like you are going to a performance. And it's not like you are in the same way that Drake, you go to a Drake concert, Drake is performing for you. You also recognize that he the man in there. Where it's very different, I feel like, in other strip clubs in the country, even black strip clubs at other places. You go in there and the clientele is like the boss is in charge and like the women are like coming up to you and trying to like convince you. And it feels very like, I don't know, I don't want to judge people, but like to me it felt Transactional. Yeah. Yeah, it feels transactional and gross. And and uh, when you go into there, those big ones there, they are very much the stars. And you walk in and it's like, it doesn't feel like they don't want to be doing it. It feels like it's something. And I mean, yes. it's all this is all just like mushy stuff that I can't uh, speak to. But just to give people, I don't know that there, how many people who listen to your show don't know much about Atlanta strip clubs, but to give my idea of what it's like, that's what it's like. Yeah, it's like, it's like the difference between going to a casino in Las Vegas right. and going to a casino in other places. Like yeah. casinos oh are only in this country, casinos are really only fun in Las Vegas yeah. and like a handful of other clubs. Not even, I mean, other casinos, not even other cities, yeah. just a handful like uh, Seminole Hard Rock uh, in Fort Lauderdale. That's a fun one, okay. right? But you go, to, you go to a casino in like Indiana. It's like going to a strip club have you, in Indiana, and it don't feel good. Have you ever been to the casino in Detroit? I have not. I've uh, not been to Detroit. Well, well don't. Don't. My first <laughs> casino casino experience was when Champ t- took me there as a rookie 
uh, took me to Vegas as a rookie. So that's my first experience with casino. And so from then on, I was like, oh, I like casinos. I didn't know I like casinos. So then there's there's some in Colorado that are a little bit out from the city. And I was like, let me go to this casino. It'll be fun. Took my girlfriend at the time. I was like, let's go. It'll be fun. It was miserable. It was like all <laughs> old people smoking. It was terrible. I was like, oh, that's just a bad casino. And we landed in Detroit to play um, uh, the, the Lions a couple years later. And some guys like, let's go to casino. I went to casino. It was depressing. Vegas is the only place that you can, I mean, for me, only place I can nah. go to casino and enjoy myself and not end up feeling sad. Yeah, nah, Vegas, exactly. Like going to Vegas and going to the casino is like going to the bar, hang out, have a drink. Yeah. People are talking. Going to the casino in the other places is like drinking outside of the liquor store. <laughs> Like you're doing the same thing you was doing at the I'm other place, that. right? Like right? in fact, you might be doing it for cheaper outside the liquor store. But the people who will be there with you as you drink outside the liquor store, this is not a celebration. This is not a party. They are not here to let loose. They are here to get numb. Yeah. Like I was at the horseshoe in Hammond, Indiana. Oh god. And I was there sitting at a table. I was I forget what I was playing, but I played a little probably blackjack, playing a little something. And I just looked at the sadness in that lady that was next to me. It was just like, I'm just getting off work and yeah. I'm here to give you my paycheck. Yeah. Here, you can have it. The desperation, man, is tough. It's like the addiction to the stuff and the desperation is really tough to deal with. In Vegas, you would think Vegas is like a gambling capital, which it is, but the pros are in there, but they're in different places than you're in. So like you can sit down at a blackjack table and play wrong in Vegas and like people will laugh with yes. you and have a good time go to one of these other places where people got they <laughs> got their mortgage on the table they got their rent on the table they got their food money on the table go ahead and hit when you're not supposed to hit that is depressing and i mean where this yo, all started yo, that's go ahead that's it's so real that's by the way, that's how you know how rigged not even rigged yeah. but what the odds are on the game the fact that the bar that the the, the dealer will tell you i think that's a bad idea yep. when have you ever been in a competition and you've been willing to do that never so you know what this is not a competition yeah. they know they're they are so sure that in the end they are going to win <laughs> that they will tell you the optimal strategies <laughs> they want you to have a good time they out here calling yes they are not arguing in the pickup game it's like oh yeah no. i found you there your ball <laughs> No, they like, don't worry, you're gonna pay your fee. Like, like by the time this is all said and done, we still they not greedy. You know what I'm saying? They not greedy. That's really nice of them. Cause if I ran the casino, it would be like no advice. Yeah, that's all. They want you to come back. They like they don't wanna that's very smart. Like they wanna hit you for ten dollars this time. And they wanna hit you for ten dollars a month for the rest of your life. I, on the other hand, try to head crack you for a hundred and hope you never come back. Yeah, yeah, like, 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 throw that, throw that spade down when you still got a club in your hand in spades, uh, and uh, see, and see if anybody at that table is gonna be like, wait a minute, you know, you're not allowed to do that. <laughs> no, sorry, Bob, <laughs> gonna come get you, man. Not happening. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Therapy doesn't mean something's wrong with you; it means you're investing in yourself to help keep your mind healthy. We get annual checkups and go to the gym to maintain physical wellness and prevent injury and disease. We get our cars tuned up to prevent bigger issues down the road. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. Why invest in everything else and not your mind? This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and the right time listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash Bomani. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash Bomani. Don't let the stress of daily life weigh on your body. Whether you're an elite athlete or someone like me, just trying to make it through the day tension-free, Theragun can help. Theragun is the handheld percussive therapy device that releases your deepest muscle tension using a scientifically calibrated combination of depth, speed, and power. And it's as quiet as an electric toothbrush. The Gen 4 Theragun doesn't just feel good. It gets to the source of the pain by releasing tension using Theragun's signature percussive therapy, which goes 60% deeper than vibration alone. After I've had a tough workout and 
got to get ready for tomorrow, it's always great to use the Theragun. Feel more relaxed and I'm much more prepared for the next workout. I try it. You should too. Theragun is trusted by 250 professional sports teams like Real Madrid and elite athletes like Paul George, DeAndre Hopkins, Maria Sharapova, hundreds of thousands of customers, and me. Try Theragun for 30 days starting at only $199. Go to therabody.com slash Bomani right now and get your Gen 4 Theragun today. That's therabody.com slash Bomani. Therabody.com slash Bomani. You know, my, I don't know if I've ever told you about this, but like my thought on Green Bay and just kind of a certain, not even irony, but they built the team around Aaron Rodgers, obviously, as you should when you have Aaron Rodgers. And best case scenario, like we've seen this happen, they went 15 and one in 2011. But best case scenario for any football team is that we win so many games in the regular season that we play all our games at home. And so, what you're hoping for is to have Aaron Rodgers out there throwing a right. frozen brick. Yeah. You know, like that's that's the thing about as much as the numbers and everything obviously indicate that you should pass the ball more and how much you should do it. This game is built in such a way. A basketball gym is the same 12 months out the year. That's not the case with a football stadium. And that the later you go, you kind of don't want to throw the ball that much until you get to the Super Bowl where you'll be somewhere where it's either tropical or domed. Mm -hmm. And then you can go ahead and get it cracking. And that's the thing I always wonder about Green Bay is if it all goes right, the game's going to be played under circumstances that are not for what you centered your team around. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what we consider their team centered around because he's the best player of it. But when they went to the LaFleur system and they started drafting running backs in the second round, like they are functionally trying to build a team that is built to run the ball. They're loaded on defense. They're, they're starting to play a lot better on defense. But the last few years, they've had a lot of talent, but it hasn't come together. But I do think that, uh, their coach, what he wants to do is run the football and their roster. Like they got a good offensive line. They got a couple of really good running backs. I think that they are now built in a way that they could function, you know, like I, they're not uncomfortable, you know, like they're not built like the Colts used to be like, that's a team mm -hmm. that's like, you get them outside in bad conditions. It could be trouble. So I think that they, I understand your point. You want to be in a situation where your best player can be at his best and Aaron won't be at his best in a snowstorm in January outdoors in Green Bay. However, the way that Dylan's been running lately, I think they'd be all right. It was actually interesting that when the stuff came out after he left, there wasn't the giant info dump that I expected to like slam him on the way out. It seemed a lot of, hey, it just didn't work on either side, right? right? Like, like he and Baker were not the right people. They said Odell was out there running his own routes and I don't know enough about that world to speak on whether that was happening or what a problem that may have caused yeah. or anything else but Baker went out there and they're like see he was better with Odell Beckham if I'm not mistaken outside of that one pass that he threw to Donovan Peoples Jones he threw something like 50 yards to wide receivers yeah he ain't do, he ain't do nothing special like that defense scored before they even got on the field and dominated that game and they ran the hell out the ball like everybody is good when your defense is scoring touchdowns and your running back is going for 70 yards touchdown runs like yeah, hit a couple passes here or there a couple of low pressure <laughs> tosses like it's a, it's a different story but one of the things i was i was thinking about with the odell thing is everyone thinks they're better without odell beckham on the roster and like the numbers support it. I'm fine with them moving on from Odell, but I was wondering, and I guess the Cincinnati game would undercut this, but I was wondering how Odell moving on impacts the, uh, the locker room psychologically, because I understand everyone looks at what they see on the field, but Odell Beckham is a cult of personality. Like Odell Beckham is a real deal celebrity. Everyone knew who he was before he got there. And he has a college teammate on the team. So I guess in my mind, it was just a like completely unfounded on anything, but just a, a thought is like, there's a chance that there's a contingent in the locker room that is team Odell and not oh, yeah. team, right. And so there is a chance that this backfires on that team. It doesn't seem like that's the case one game in. And I have no reason to believe that it, that it will, but it was something that I was thinking about the whole time is just because he ain't put up these numbers. Don't mean he don't got a crew. Like, it don't mean he's not a leader, dog. and you send him away. Uh -huh. Dog, they said – because actually I'm, I am interested in the fact that I haven't heard much from Jarvis Landry on this because that's, that's not just his college homie. Yeah. That's his homie homie, right. you know. But they said to Odell, beginning of the year, invite everybody out to the crib 
right? Like it does that. And was telling the young boys that they could take whatever clothes or shoes they wanted out of his closet. Number one, Flex. Flex, right? He's like, even if it's my favorite one, baby, I ain't, I'll wear stuff twice, o right? Odell, Flex. Odell is Vegas in this situation. <laughs> like, I don't care. <laughs> take, take a little bit. <laughs> Yo, and I bet them rookies be in there like, you know how you don't want to be the first person when they yeah. say the food ready, right? Like, you don't want to be the first person. There is one rookie in there that was like, nah, man, I ain't trying. There was another one that was like, as soon as after everybody left, hey, Odell, um, I think I left my wallet there. Can I come back and look? <laughs> and then come back, and that dude got a moving box. Oh, you know what I'm God. saying? And he just out there like, hey, you, you said you were an 11, right? <laughs> Me too. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that is a hell of a flex, man. Just... Take what you want. This man is inviting people to steal from him and don't even care. <laughs> yeah. That's outstanding. Yeah, but but to your point, yes, there yeah. is an Odell squad because there was always a T.O. squad, Yeah, right? Like the problem with T.O. wasn't that everybody liked him. The problem, everybody hated him. It was that some people hated him right. and some people loved him. And that's how, that's polarizing, right. right? If everybody's on uh, team you yeah. then everything works out a little bit different and so i will be interested in seeing it because here's the other part too you and i kind of feel the same about mayfield i don't need to slam him mm -mm. but i don't think he's remarkable in any way like nobody can point to it and people want it to be so bad yeah. but there's nothing to indicate that he is at all remarkable and if you and i from here are like that dude ain't remarkable there's somebody on that team that think he a bull yeah right like like there's there's dudes out there that's like man he's sorry if if, if scotty pippen could spend all this time trying to explain to us basically michael jordan i mean i ain't saying he ain't good <laughs> yeah but you know yeah. Like the perception of stuff. Going to we talk, we, yeah, we all assume that everyone sees things the same way, but depending on where you stand and things look different inside that locker room, Baker looks different. And I don't know if it makes him look a little shinier or make him look a little dustier to those guys. It may be different depending on the guy, but like, I know I was never a great player in the league. Like I had great seasons and great games, but I was never like a great player. But even I in the locker room, at times, we're looking at players that were much better than me. And looking at them like, man, if this dude do this one more time, because you're so close to it. <laughs> and I also know, like, at some times, people are looking at me like, man, this boy better get it together. And your perception, like, the dissonance between what's actually happening and how you feel it's happening, like, this ties to Aaron Rodgers and just, like, in general, how hard it is to admit you are wrong. It's so hard to be honest with yourself. In that situation. So you're in that locker room. Your perspective is not the same as my perspective because I'm not in there. So the assumption is being closer to someone makes you like them more. <laughs> oh, not true. <laughs> not true. All depends. Yeah, it all depends. All, been there. All depends. Exactly. All depends, right? You know what I think is interesting? For someone to be as famous as Odell Beckham is, and it's so polarized. Like, I was even watching today, like Jeremy Fowler was talking about where he's going to sign. And the phrasing he used was interesting um, on Get Up, where he was like, uh, Odell has the power here. He's a free agent, right? Like, all, mm -hmm. like everybody, but the, the need to use that phrasing again gets to the place where Odell is kind of perpetually seen right. as a threat to people. But you think about it, man. He don't really be doing a whole lot of interviews. I don't really know what his voice sounds like. Like, I'm not an Instagram type and yeah. in that space, right? So I don't traffic in where celebrity is really cultivated at this point. Right. But I don't find him to be the hey, look at me guy that I think a lot of people want to make it out to be. He was out there blocking for the Browns. Yeah, I you mean, know? Odell is not that guy. I think you hit on this last time we talked about Odell is you can't help but look at him. He's not hey, look at me, but everyone looks at him. And, like, he's not unique. Uh, I mean, I don't mean it that way. I mean, his behavior is not unique right. amongst players of his class. Like, if anything, considering when he was in New York and was the best receiver in the league, the amount of exposure that you got of Odell was limited. And the stuff that we point back to as being a problem was, like, the man went on a, a trip and took off his shirt and took a picture with his boys on a boat before a playoff game. Like, that's the negative thing. The other stuff is he fought a man on the field because he was so enraged by what was happening. He knocked down the kicking net and then proposed to a kicking net. Like, that is mild, mild stuff compared to the the way that they're painting them. And I think it's in, in it large a part. a long time ago. Yeah. 
And it's a lot, yeah, because when we're having these conversations and I, I try to be delicate with like my colleagues when I'm doing this, but like on Get Up, I don't remember who it was, but I was up there with somebody who was saying, you don't want, I was, it was, I'm David Pollack. And he was saying, you don't want to put Odell in New England with a rookie quarterback. And I was like, why not? <laughs> you know, like I was, I, I, it, it just seemed like there is a kind of a prototype of this diva receiver that we have assigned to Odell based on some very minor infractions from a long time ago and him having bright hair and him being handsomer than all of you. Like, just like, it, that's what it feels like it's tied to to me. Cause like, what his, what evidence do we have the exception of his daddy st- sending this out? I don't know that it, we have any evidence of him being a problem in a locker room. Mm-mm. Nah, uh, you mentioned family as our time's getting a little shorter. Does this sound familiar? You got one device that lets you catch the game live, another that lets you stream your favorite shows, you watch the sports highlights on your phone, and you've got your neighbor's best friend's login for the good stuff. Well, I want to tell you about a simple way to get all that entertainment you love without the hassle, and a great way to finally get your TV together. It's called Direct TV Stream, and it brings your live TV and on-demand favorites together like never before, so you can watch your favorite sports, movies, and shows all in one place. So get rid of the clutter and the confusion and get your TV together with DirecTV Stream. You can learn more at directtv.com. That's directtv.com. Compatible device required. Content varies by package. Gatorade knows there are many paths to greatness. How you get there is up to you. Sometimes you got to grind it out, get up early and put in the work, even when you're not feeling 100. Sometimes it takes staying focused on a goal, knowing where you want to be and that you'll have to pour everything in to get there. Other times, you just need to dig deep and show some guts to be brave and never let anything stand in the way of what you can accomplish. Then there are the days you just have to get in the gym and see some gains to put in all the reps and get stronger each day. But whatever path you take to greatness, Gatorade's formula is there to help fuel it. Greatness starts with G. Sorry, we didn't get to the black quarterbacks this week, but there'll always be next week to get to the black quarterbacks. Don't you worry. I can't wait. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Um, Speaking of family, the Jokic brothers. So for those of you, you must have seen this, where Jokic had enough of the Morris twin who hit him. And by the way, right, I ain't saying that the Morris twins ain't tougher than me, but I am saying I feel like they get a lot of tough points, and I don't know exactly why. I don't know. I mean, they told that story to you. That's one reason that stands out. Yeah, yeah, no, they did have that thing where they got into that fight, uh, uh, you know, in college over the woman. And then there was, they were acquitted for this, which amazes me. But that time that they allegedly jumped into Rolls Royce Phantom and went and stomped out they play daddy because they found out that they play daddy was uh, playing with mama. Um, Mm -hmm. Someone had seen a text message and then they rolled out. And I still don't know if they were identified as being two six nine dudes in a Rolls Royce Phantom. Um, in Phoenix, I'm trying to figure out who the other six nine black dudes in Phoenix with the Rolls Royce Phantoms are, but they were acquitted. Okay, it went that way, but they get all these tough points. Again, I haven't seen it. I'm not saying it doesn't yeah. exist. I'm not saying they soft. I'm just not exactly sure why everybody feels this way about them. Now the Jokic brothers, apparently one of them in his spare time does the MMA. Um. Another one, he played ball at the University of Detroit Mercy, which meant that he had to spend some actual Detroit time because who else you think is on that team yeah. and where you going to be going to hoop? And then there's the other Jokic, and the one thing they all have in common is they from over there. Yeah. Um, I don't know I don't know what they was doing over there. Yeah. I don't know where they was staying over there. I talked to one of my homeboys who spent some time over there, and he's like, no, nah, it's, it's a little real over there what they talking about these boys say after what happened with the heat the Jokic brothers gonna yeah. b- have bought tickets to the game on november 29th in miami with the heat they can't let them in the arena i'm sorry like I, i'm not for <laughs> these types of, of bands like they've done nothing wrong but it just to me seems like a bad idea yeah, it seems like a bad idea to have them in and have them in there i know i mean i've heard stories about the brothers and the from being over there, that that part, as far as toughness is concerned, America is a, is a wonderful country, man. It's terrible in many ways, but like the exposure to the level of corruption and poverty and desperation yes. that are in some countries, like it 
Civil War. Yeah. Wasn't that long ago over there? Yeah. It's just you walk into school and and there's there's bra da 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 da. <laughs> you know? And it's just like you what, don't what's stop there to walking. fear. Yeah. And it's like like rubble from bombs that were dropped a couple weeks ago. Like I, I mean, I'm I'm basing this off of documentaries because I ain't never been there and I don't never want to go. Like I haven't been to Brazil and like favelas and stuff like that, which is not over there, but like just understanding that there are levels to all of this and America's floor is low and embarrassingly low in some places, but it ain't low as it is in some of these other places. Yeah, nah, nah, like the most important factor to win in a fight is not being afraid of losing a fight. Yeah. Right? Like the person that's not afraid yeah. has a big, big advantage in the fight, right? And so, like, I don't know how many people you know from New Orleans. Mm -hmm. They not all gangsters. Right. None of them are scared. Yeah. Right? Like, I think about my friends from New Orleans who are college professors, who are guidance counselors, who yeah. are seventh grade teachers. Mm -hmm. Like, no matter who it is, none of them are scared. Why? Because you would, you, if you walking around New Orleans scared, you done. Yeah. That's it. Like I say, Peyton Manning might even be not scared and we don't realize. Right. But if like my the, everybody I know from New Orleans is not scared because they come from New Orleans and that's just kind of what's required. There's, right. There's also some, it's gotta be like that over there, right? Of course. <laughs> I I think that there's also like a like a cultural element. So like culture in general is kind of like the accepted behaviors and activities. It's like a good way for me, at least to understand what culture is in an organization or a company or whatever. It's like the things that are accepted and expected of you and things that are you're comfortable with. So like you'll go somewhere and people will eat something that you're just like, oh, that's outrageous. But like culturally for them, that's fine. My brother travels a whole bunch and he said that they tried to give him some monkey brain somewhere he went and mm -hmm. he didn't want to be rude, but he was like, that was their culture. And he said, had they not served it in a skull, he might have tried it. But over there, that's how you do it. It's comfortable, you know? Like, it's whatever. Like, I remember when I was a kid, the idea of eating raw fish, outrageous. But all of a sudden, sushi caught on in America, and now I love mm -hmm. it. So, like, I think about that in, in the respect when we talk about people from places like this, where it's like, there are things that they had to do, things that they had to see, and it's just culturally accepted. So like when you are in, and I think that explains a lot of people's behavior is like the expectation. And now I'm not talking about them specifically, but there are people that I know where the expectation is somebody in your crew, if not everybody in your crew has committed some really, really violent crimes. Let's just put it that way. And so then yeah. it's so much easier for people in that crew to be like, oh no, that's what you do, you know? So like, I think <laughs> that's the part of the part, that's the part that makes me concerned about measuring the toughness of people from over there because like what we think is tough they think is like tuesday <laughs> it is not right. fair for me to categorize all of them like that but like culturally it's fair to say that if you grow up in a war-torn place like you are a little bit com more comfortable with uh yeah some they, they've things. seen some things right that would be the way to put exactly. it yo speaking of seeing things did i tell you who i'm gonna go see today who that so today we are uh, shooting uh, back on the record with Bob Costas. You can check that out, 11 o'clock um, Eastern on HBO, following real time with Bill Maher. And your man, Jera, um, is going to be a guest. Oh. So I am going to meet Jerry uh, for the first time. And just so you understand how things work, this studio that we're shooting at, um, unlike the other studio we have, they got rooms for people to like, like their own little hangout, mm -hmm. chill out rooms. You know what I mean? Yep. And I was walking to my chill out room. And so I walk and I see Bob Costas chill out room. And then I see what I think is my chill out room. And they all like decorated. Like they definitely call somebody in to mm -hmm. do this. Now that's not always a guarantee, by the way, just so you guys yeah. know at these studios, you'd be amazed how much old decrepit stuff is in studios. They don't do a lot of freshening up at these places. Mm -hmm. And so I walk past this one room. It's got this fly couch set up and the whole dot. And I'm like, cool, I'm walking. No, nah, that was Jerry's. Uh, yeah. that, that was Jerry's. Mm -hmm. And so we get to the end of the room, hallway where we get to my room. And it does have a chair. <laughs> but there will be no putting my feet up. <laughs> that, was, that was reserved for Jerry. It's a hierarchy, baby. You'll love yes. Jerry. If you, um, if you guys have like some time to hang out before or after, like, I mean, it's obvious. It goes without saying. Anyone who is as popular as he is and been around is like the dude got um Bill Clinton level charisma. Where like yeah. you hang out with him, you'll you'll love him no matter what you believe he stands for. Like he's got a hell of a memory. I, I ran into him at a Super Bowl 
And he just randomly, he stopped, talked to me for 15 minutes, remembered everything there is to remember about me and made me laugh and moved on. Like he, he going to hit you with that. You're going to, he'll win you over. You're going to be a Jarrah fan. Well, you got to rem- you got to remember, too, with me and Jerry, and this is the difference between where you and I grew up, right? Yeah. Where you grew up oh, yeah. on the East Coast and I grew up in Texas. Cats like him are so very familiar to me, yeah. right? Like, I almost have, there's a certain, as long as they not, like, being jerks and try to, like, withhold my rights and stuff actively, <laughs> um, there's a certain nostalgia I can get with yeah. coming across a Jerry Jones type. Like, I know exactly how that dude is wired and what his get down is, you know? Yeah. And look, this man made his money. How do you make your money, Jerry? I go dig holes in the ground and spend a lot of money to do it and hope it's oil in there. Yep. No, nah, he's a, he's a, I mean, uh, humble's not the word, but like, I think he has a reasonable grasp on his place in the world. And he also doesn't take himself too seriously and he loves people. So like, if you, if you pop up in Jerry's um, chill out room and just introduce yourself, he's not going to let you leave. You'd be like, oh, yeah, mm-hmm. Bomani Jones. Like, yeah, I, I grew up in Houston part of the time. He goes, like, oh, you ain't going nowhere. Jerry going to get, he going to regale you with all types of stories. And you meet him two times, he might invite you on his bus. I ain't going to lie. If he invited me on the bus, I'm going. Yeah, he ain't. Like, I don't even know how ethical it is, whatever it yeah. is, whatever. I'm going. I don't he even invited- drink, but I'll drink that blue label. So we, through negotiations, like, we would see each other, like, for four days at a time for several months in a row. So he invited me on the bus several times and I that was an ethical situation where I was like, man, I can't do this. I wanted to so badly. Oh, no, no, no. I wanted to yeah, so yeah, badly. You, you'd have to quit the yeah, union. Yeah. If you had gotten on the bus under them circumstances and then came back, yo, Dominique, where you been, man? I was just hanging out with Jerry. <laughs> you can come too. go so silent. <laughs> <laughs> I need to hit him up. Like, remember that bus invite? You said we was going to go on the private jet to Vegas. What's up? Let's do it, brother. <laughs> Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, that is Dominic Fosworth. Check him out on undefeated.com. Check him out at De- on Debatable. Check him out on Get Up. Just check him out all over the place. My man greatly appreciate it as always. Oh, it was great. I won't tell anybody what we do, Jerry. Just give me a call. Woo. And ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us here on The Right Time. We do this three times a week. Gabe Bassane and Dave Presley handling everything behind the scenes. Thank you, gentlemen. Remember, follow The Right Time. Rate us, review us, give us five stars. You only give us four stars. I'm inclined to believe you are a hater. And we'll talk to you guys in a couple of days. Take it easy.